Mario by myself, and then at uh, 5 o'clock, Michelle will serve dinner, followed by that group uh, brainstorming discussion. And then uh, Dr. Zhang will fight, uh, also from me, and will be closing the session around 6 o'clock. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Brother Nang Bae. In, in the from the faith perspective, I believe all 
all faiths struggle with the issue of uh, justice and equality for all. But coming from an Islamic perspective, when we, uh, we see the clear guidance of God Almighty teaches us that all of you are created by a single pair of a male and female, and God created us into different uh, colors or nations or ethnicities just for a recognition. Our color does not make us better. Our color does not make us pious. Our, our color, our language, our financial uh, strength uh, does not make us uh, uh, closer to God Almighty. It is our relationship with, with God Almighty. And uh, you know, this, this relationship which, which is described in the Quran is, is very personal, very spiritual, spiritual. And um, uh, no one can be a judge of that relationship. So, and we see that from the seerah of our Prophet, from the life of Prophet Muhammad, uh, may peace and blessings be upon him, that how he um, uh, loved his companions, uh, how he took care of his companions, he, uh, you know, uh, was caring and kind and generous, and he, uh, he was able to uh, develop their talents that God Almighty had given them. So, you know, we know that companions came from different backgrounds, different economic, social backgrounds, different uh, uh, tribes, but when it came to their relationship with the companion, uh, with the prophet, they, were, they all felt closer to him. Uh, his is uh, a friend, his is a companion. So from that perspective, um, as a Muslim, or a personally, and I'm sure my Muslim brothers and sisters present here, we, we, we share with you many stories. And then our uh, desire in seeking that kind of a just and balanced society, where people are not judged by the color of the skin, but really the content of their character, uh, as, as uh, Martin Luther King mentioned in, in his speech as well. So with that, I am very happy and delighted that you were able to come and spend this Sunday afternoon with us and we look forward to a wonderful program. Thank you.
She has been sought out by her peers for her knowledge in the area of immigration law and policy, chairing international trainings and conferences, and she has a perfect excellent a record for delivery of a broad range of client advocacy services. Our next uh, panelist is Mr. Rizwan uh, Sathiri. He's the president of the United Muslim uh, Count, Maryland Muslim Council, an umbrella organization serving about half a million or 400,000 Muslims in the state of Maryland, working with the different Muslim councils in the different uh, counties. Uh, he oversees uh, county level grassroots local Muslim councils. He's also a professional uh, licensed civil and environmental engineer. He's also on the Maryland Higher Education uh, Commission. And uh, he has, uh, he works at EBA uh, Engineering, which is a, a firm, construction firm in Baltimore City. He was the past president, former president of the Howard County Muslim Council, as involved in several other community initiatives. Our next uh, panelist is uh, Imam Hassan Amin from Baltimore City. He's Imam at Johns Hopkins University and chaplain at Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital. He, mashallah, has a very long bio, so I'm going to have to chop it up a little bit, so please forgive me for that. Uh, but he has been, uh, in 2004, the, the mayor designated March 2004 as Imam Hassan Amin Day in Baltimore City. It was proclaimed because of his work fighting crime in the neighborhoods and on the streets of Baltimore City. Also in 2010, he received the Samson Green Award for his work in the community and in the field of social work. In 2012, he was received the Hero of Justice Award from the University of Maryland Social, uh, School of Social Work. In 2014, he received the Alumni of the Year Award from the University of Maryland School of Social Work as well. In 2004, he was inducted into the Martial Arts Hall of Fame. Our next uh, panelist is uh, Imam Khalid uh, Griggs. He's Associate Chaplain at Wake Forest University. He's also the board chair of the Ignite Council for Social Justice. He brings to us a lot of uh, involvement in the community, a lot of uh, wealth of information. And then uh, we have been joined by, as well, uh, Reverend Ron Steik. Steve. He's an ordained minister at the United Church of Christ. He's the executive director of the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. And, um, which serves 325 religious organizations in the U.S. committed to uh, providing you know, social justice and uh, ending U.S. sponsored torture. He's been the executive director at NARCAT since 2007. And then lastly but not least, our uh, esteemed judge, Hassan, uh, Hassan Amin, was an associate judge at Prince George's County Circuit Court. He was born in Charleston, West Virginia, where he attended school over there. He received his JD from the University of Maryland School of Law and subsequently admitted to the Maryland Bar. His professional affiliations and accomplishments include the District of Columbia Bar, 1984, U.S. Supreme Court, U.S. District Courts for Maryland, District of Columbia, U.S. Courts of Appeal for Fourth Circuit, and District of Columbia Circuit Attorney. He has a private practice as well. So with that, I'd like to welcome our panelists. We'll start with a few questions. I just want to uh, ask everyone to adhere to like a minute or a half or two minutes just because of the, the, the time we have. Uh, we'll start from my side and just with that. So the first question, what does freedom of expression mean and where does the line get drawn between freedom of expression and blasphemy or even misrepresentation? has to do with undue government interference 
in the expression, uh, verbal or otherwise, of, of people. And it's not talking about individuals not being able to express whatever they want to express, whether it is accurate or not. And the freedom of expression in the United States has had a very uh, challenging history in that the courts, for the most part, have had to decide whether or not something is a violation of the First Amendment. And if I'm incorrect, the judge will uh, correct me on this. But I think we are basically challenged from the faith community to recognize beyond our faith communities that we have the responsibility to stand up for each other and to protect one another, whether or not someone is hiding behind the shield of freedom of expression or not. And we also, I believe, are challenged very much to go from our local efforts to try to elevate uh, issues such as freedom of expression and protection of the rights of, of all persons of all faith and every person in the country, that we have to elevate this to a national level. We are doing great work for the most part on local levels, but we have to elevate this uh, to the national level. Thank you. I said I like this is the rule, and I'm not the only one who brought back the Constitution today, but this is the rule. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. This is bedrock, the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. There are exceptions. You cannot yell fire in a crowd of fear if there's no fire, because you have obviously induce a panic situation, and you can be cited, tried and convicted, or perhaps disturbance of the peace, whatever. But short of that, you can do just about almost anything if it's just speech. You can convene a, an ill-intentioned uh, seminar to denigrate the prophet, Salah Holy Wasallam. You can burn Qur'anis. Yes, it's stupid and it's destructive, but it's also an exercise of free speech. And remember this convention not too long ago where two, uh, at least identified Muslims, came to this convention where they were going to uh, post cartoons of the prophet, peace be on him. And they want to see which one was the best one. And these brothers came armed with guns and they were cut down before they even got into the place. And my take on that was as follows. And pardon the uh, graphic nature of this analogy, but if you defecate somewhere, People might gather around it to say what it is, but then it draws flies. And the weak-minded, ill-prepared people who want to go to that uh, waste heap get penalized. Both the people who make it and the people who are trapped by it. Jim, you like to address that? Thank you. Um, first, I would like to say I'm very, uh, I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you for the Islamic Circle of North America and Islamic Leadership Institute of America for inviting me here and being amongst these wonderful panelists. Um, I am not a legal scholar, but I am uh, a lawyer who did go to law school right here in Baltimore, University of Baltimore Law School. <laughs> um, I have also studied U.S. history, and I appreciate the the question in the content or in the context in which we're here today, interfaith, 
um, group of, of leaders and, and community members. Um, and I think about where do we get this right? Where is this right of freedom of expression derived? Um, and I wanted to share a quote. Uh, the sacred rights of mankind are not to be rummaged for among old parchments or, or musty records. They are written as with a sunbeam in the whole volume of human nature by the hand of divinity itself. It can never be erased or obscured by mortal power. That quote is by Alexander Hamilton. And I think that when I was thinking about this question, I was thinking, where do we derive these rights? And who protects those rights? And that is the tension I think that we, we feel and we see in civil society. When you derive a right from God, from your maker, um, yet we, deter we rely upon civil society to protect our rights. Um, so that's the tension that I was thinking of, and I believe that those rights are protected by, um, by the community coming together and, as the judge said, holding each other accountable.
problems that we got through. We pretty much covered already a freedom of expression, opinion, speech. So I want to look at another portion of this, which is uh, really disrespectful. And that is the only time when the Prophet of Islam or Allah Ta'ala said when the of the Sahaba were, were disrespectful to, uh, towards him. And then Allah, he sent down an ayat to the people. He said, oh, you who believe, um, do not raise your voices above the voice of the Prophet or be loud or loud to hit him in speech, like the loudest of some of you to others. Least you, your deeds become worthless with, um, while you uh, perceive not. And so this particular ayah or, or this particular verse, uh, Allah spoke those Muslims who were disrespectful towards the Prophet. And we talk about the same thing here. Speech is okay, opinion is okay, expression is okay, but when it becomes disrespectful, that is not okay. And, and I, I'm glad the judge is here, we don't really use him a lot. Um, and that is when you talk about li a li being liable or slander. You talk about being disrespectful to someone, you talk about the liability of being liable to the person or slander the person, meaning that you do a false statement um, that will harm the reputation of an individual, a religion, or, or a nation, or some kind of government. And so when it gets to that point of disrespect, then at that, at that point, then we, there should be some response from, from the Muslim community, meaning more than likely a legal response um, from the Muslim community. Because we really don't bother anyone. Everyone bothers us. And so I think that at some point, we probably have to go legal on them, because something that's the only thing that people understand. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, so as the panel we're, we're discussing uh, this question, uh, I just want to share this uh, parable, this uh, verse from Surah Al-Baqarah, the second chapter of the Quran. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, says, Let it grow up deep. There's no compulsion in the, the way of life or the belief in faith. But the bayan al min al that the, the misguidance has become clear from, from, the, from the guidance, from the following the path of God. So even in our faith, there's no compulsion. And like several of our parents have, have expressed that people could express their opinions, and, and God, in the Quran, he mentions to us how not just the prophet, peace be upon him, but all the messengers and prophets were mocked by their people. They were, uh, you know, accused of things like being magicians, you know, crazy people, poets, and, and so on and so forth. All the prophets, Noah, peace be upon him, they used to plug their ears, you know, as he would talk to them and so forth. Um, but also, we have a way how to, to deal with that, which maybe we'll talk about in the second question. So moving on to the next question, maybe we can start from the, the other side this time. In your opinion, how should a group respond to others who mock their ideals or values? What recommendations would you offer Muslim youth in particular, parents and educators, when other groups misrepresent the core values of Islam or principles, or the qualities of their prophet, or other aspects of Islam and faith in general? Well, so I want to talk about I'm back. Well, one thing that has to happen is that uh, Muslims have to understand, people of faith have to understand that your faith is strong. Your faith is stronger than whatever people are going to say, say about you. Because all the prophets at some point were mocked or harassed or called crazy. And so we also, our prophet, Muhammad, Muhammad, the last uh, messenger sent to mankind, he also was mocked. And he was called crazy in the, in the light. And so you have to keep in mind that Allah Ta'ala says, um, this day I have perfected your respect for you your religion and completed my favor upon you and have approved for you the uh, religion or Islam as your religion. So that's, that's one thing. And he said that you are the best of the people. Why? Right? Because you forbid what is wrong and you do what is right. That's, uh, that's the other thing. And the last thing I, I want to say is perhaps for these people that you mentioned, the Muslim youth and the parents and the educators and so forth, perhaps um, this particular organization, IPNA, can, can have a sort of a, a mock line, M-O-C-K, mock line. In other words, people can call you to find out, okay, they're mocking me, what do I do? Because you may not be able to answer all the questions now, and you have to take each one of these particular group of people case by case. The youth have their own issues and problems that they have to deal with for mocking the school and bullying, and then of course the parents have their problems and educators and also the leaders. And so perhaps some kind of mock line can be set up and you can call in and then we got any directions in terms of what, what to do. And let me just say this last, this last piece. And those people in here who know this particular sword, I want you to say it with me. And that is sword to that path, you know. I'll start it off and you're going to join in with me. I'll open the language and say, Dawn Rajim, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, Kuyya, Ami, 
So uh, Google that and look it up. It's a pretty good segment. I like how Seek Mind me anyway. That's a good segment. He's interviewing Randy Brinson, the head of the Christian Coalition, on this campaign that we did. They didn't know what hit him. They had no idea where these people, where all these people come from. Nobody has ever posted them before there, but we did. Um, yeah, I, I think that the best way to combat hate speech is not suppression, um, but tolerant, truthful, and intelligent speech. I think about my work at FIRM, uh, Foreign Board Information Referral Network, and how that organization doesn't serve a particular demographic. We have become a strong organization because we learn from the collective experiences of others. I think about my work with Catholic Legal Immigration Network Clinic, which is funded by the, the United Conference of Catholic Bishops and is in partnership with other faith organizations to come together and try to advocate for comprehensive immigration law and laws that are fair um, here in the United States and generous to those who seek to enter the United States. And I believe that together as a collective, we can do more. Um, my guidance to Muslim youth would be to Look to your friends in school, look to your neighbor, and ask for help. Because together, we can combat hate speech. Together, in our own homes, we can teach our children love for our, our neighbors. And that is a true testament to, to my faith. My Christian faith is that um, teaches me to love my neighbor as myself and to welcome the stranger. And if Together we can find those commonality, the commonalities in our faith. Um, we can better combat that which is wrong. Thank you. I don't know how many of you grew up with this little saying, this little aphorism, but it's helped me throughout my life, and uh, I like to teach it to my children and grandchildren whenever I get a chance. Sticks and stones may break my bones. But names will never hurt me. You all remember that? Say it with me. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. So, listen, as an African American growing up in Charleston, West Virginia, if I had a dollar for every time I got called the N word, I, I would be, I would have a fortune. I'd be invested somewhere. Listen, if somebody said that Muhammad Ali was and give a press conference and they told him, listen, the, Muhammad, the, the mayor of Louisville just said the N word. He said, nigger, on a, in, in some private conference. And Muhammad Ali turned to him and said, so what? <laughs> you know, uh, this is what we deal with. We're not afraid of names and, and, and uh, being uh, mischaracterized. Uh, what gives feed to that is when we pull on it, add to it by violence and inappropriate response, as has been mentioned before. I'm glad the brother mentioned CARE because I think they do a great job of combating um, misrepresentation right in its face. Uh, and uh, the other brother mentioned it too. There's one thing that we can't ignore though, and that is the promise of Allah. Allah says, uh, help is near. And sometimes we ignore help. I think about President Obama as he ran for, uh, when he was sitting in front of a president, from whom did he get help? Calling power of all people. I mean, here was a, 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 a general whose uh, record had never been solved, who had credibility with uh, even the uh, white establishment, he unassailable his credentials. And all of a sudden, he was saying, Well, you know, I've examined both people and da 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 da, but Barack Obama is the man. We have had help from the Pope. Pope Francis, remember that interview on the plane? They asked him, you know, uh, when Charlie Hebdo uh, affair was happening, which was very ugly, and they said, well, you know, what do you have to say about that? He said, well, listen, if people talk about my grandmother and my mother, I come up, I'm going to bop them in the face. That was the human being. That is the human response. That is the recognition of the justice, the justification of such response. However, then they said, well, but are you condoning violence or are you? No, absolutely not. It's just a, a, a reaction and uh, there are limits. The Pope was saying there are, there are limits on what should be done. It doesn't mean that our reaction should be uh, a physical one. But it, I, I did uh, think that 
a, whole, a message was being sent to the whole of humanity. By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this uh, modern uh, religious leader, who said, free speech should have its limits. But we know that when it gets to be uh, action in terms of violence, it's never worth it. So you have to fight it, as my colleague just said, with education, with enlightenment, and with bedrock things. So teach your kids, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Names will never hurt you. You just have to keep on being good, righteous, and a model. Thank you. Sonny. Uh, I guess the intelligent thing for me to do is say I agree with everything that's been said and sit down. And since I'm not too intelligent, I will try to make a couple of comments here. I worked in the public school system in uh, Winston Salem, North Carolina for 14 years. And I have a slightly different take on how words can impact individuals. I worked in high school and middle school directing an alternative program. And what I saw during this time, and I, I saw it with Muslim students as well, that to be called out of their name, to be verbally abused, oftentimes had a much deeper impact on Muslim children and other children than a physical beating. You get hit in the eye, the eye goes down, the blackness goes out of the eye, and you're okay. But words can hurt, and Muslims or no child or no adult should have to be subjected to the ignorance of other folks. I grew up in apartheid, Winston Salem, North Carolina, at a time when there was nothing short of apartheid. But that was in the 1950s. That was in the 1960s. And as a nation, we should not hold standards from an earlier period and think that we should have to tolerate these things, being called certain names, whether it's for racial reasons, reasons or religious reasons. I don't think that's acceptable. It should be acceptable to any of us at any time right now. And for as far as the Muslim community goes, I think that what I would say to our Muslim youth and say to Muslim parents as well is that we should follow the Sunnah, the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that even when he was verbally abused and even physically abused, he didn't retaliate in kind, particularly in Mecca. He did not retaliate in kind, but neither did he go and hide. Neither did he retreat and slink into a corner and say, because they're talking about me, I'm not going to project, I'm not going to continue to carry this message in a very unapologetic way. And so I think that uh, what I've seen, and, and please forgive me, I'm, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone, I'm starting with myself, but I think too often Muslims in this country, because we want to be safe, we, everyone wants to feel secure, we want our children to be safe, we oftentimes encourage ourselves and our children to compromise their identity. Just get along. Take off if you're a girl. Take off your head star. So they won't, you won't be the object of this kind of abuse. Rather than that, we should be insisting that this abuse stop. That it's not tolerable. I don't know how many times I've had to go, and I'll shut up, but I don't know how many times I've had to go to public schools when I was working in the school system and challenge the principals or the assistant principals to do their job. Because bullying is not tolerable. No one child should be bullied because of their religion or because of their race or because of their uh, economic status or anything else. It's intolerable and as a Muslim community, my encouragement is look at this example of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Peace be upon him. It was not an example of running and hiding. It was an example of knowing your religion and presenting it in a very forceful manner to others. Thank you. So if I understood correctly, uh, just a summary of our panel's discussion, um, learning from previous mistakes that our nation or experiences that our nation has, has gone through, uh, patience, education, uh, knowing our rights, not compromising, and also um, being patient and, and 
following the, the guidance. And this kind of reminds me with uh, an ayah surah to a chapter of, of women, chapter 4 of the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically talks about mocking uh, the religion or the, the people who follow the faith or the prophets. And he says, um, if you are sitting with a group of people who mock you, then walk away. Do not engage in them with a discussion. Just walk away until they stop that behavior or attitude, and then you can go back and, and re-engage with them. So this is very much in line with what our panels have just mentioned. All right, so we're going to move into uh, move on to question three. Uh, how can America's diversity be an asset, and in which ways could it become a liability if it's not used properly? So again, we can uh, keep our you know, responses short. I think we'll start with the first slide. Very short. Diversity in this ideal, uh, ideal formulation should never be should never be a liability in the nation. Uh, what becomes more of a challenge is when we don't have a, a homogeneous population. Uh, for an example, in, in nations, uh, and it's not like this all uh, completely now, but in nations like Japan. In other nations where there is a more homogeneous population, they are not as challenged to be inclusive and embracing of the various cultures and, uh, and linguistics and other people. But in diversity, as Allah tells us in the Quran, is part of the majesty of Allah. That it is a praising of God to even recognize the diversity, because God is the author, Allah is the author of this diversity. He created the diversity, the languages, skin tones, and all of the ethnicities, and all these other things. So we have to uh, appreciate and push this uh, uh, acceptance, and not just acceptance or toleration, but an inclusion of diversity. So it should not be a liability of any nation at any time, if it is, then that means we just have to work harder. Yes, I agree that diversity is at almost no point in which there's too much diversity. The only time when that diversity is a problem is after a leader or a convener has made a decision after having sure with the people who are in a position to advise that person. Uh, and then there's a decision made, all of a sudden you get a breakaway group and there is unwelcome diversity. Uh, that's after a decision is made, but diversity is a great thing. Let, let me uh, share one thing with you. It, I, on a daily basis, I see the beauty of diversity. I sit in the circuit court for Prince George's County, and even as a district court judge, we've had people coming from uh, overseas, we've had people who speak French as their native language, we have people Arabic as a native language, and certainly a lot of Latinos who speak Spanish, and it really, really helps the bench, that is the judges, to be reflective, reflective of the uh, diversity of the citizens, the citizenry. The other day I had two Pakistani uh, couples who were represented by attorneys, both of them, and uh, of course it was a contested divorce, contested custody, and I'm going to tell you that 50% of our caseload in Prince George's County and throughout the state of Maryland, just about, is families breaking up, all right? Some form of divorce, custody, uh, child support, it, it just uh, has basically e exploded. So anyway, here come these two Pakistani litigants, and imagine their surprise when after the judge takes the bench and the formalities are uh, dispensed with, I say to each of them, Assalamu alaikum, Mr. So and so. And they're like, Whoa. So I was hoping and praying that maybe just that little bit of leverage could maybe induce some settlement talks. I'm not sure whether I'm successful at that point or not, but it does help a lot. And so this is what is really nice when you see leaders who look like you. We all like them. That's why, you know, we like Tiger Woods on a golf course, even though he's, you know, whatever. Gavin Nation. And uh, you like to see the uh, basketball players, Abdul, this and that. I mean, you know, you just like that. That helps you identify with what's going on. So I am a huge proponent of diversity. We do not have enough of it. 
we're nowhere close to it in our institutions and, and seats of government. Agreed. I, um, I'm a resident of Power County by choice. I live in Columbia, Maryland, which is known to be a diverse community. Um, I believe strongly that America's diversity is its incredible asset. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't have de dedicated the last 15 years of my life to immigration law. I believe many of us have heard the metaphor of the United States or as America as a melting pot. I'm not, not fond of that metaphor. Um, which inspires sort of ideas of assimilation and us all kind of melding together. Later in life, or later in, in America's history, we heard of the metaphor of America as the salad bowl, and I'm still not fond of that quite yet. I, I still don't think that really does us justice. But it was at least trying to come to um, an acknowledgement of multiculturalism. Um, I've heard the term mosaic as a newer term. And I'm, I'm a country girl. I came from England, and um, I, I moved to a farm here in, in Maryland. Um, and we have lots of quilts in England, and we have lots of quilts in the farming community. Um, and I kind of like the metaphor of the quilt that never ends, the infinite quilt. Um, and if you think about quilts that have been passed around, or passed down generation to generation, almost sacred um, because of the hands um, that stitched that quilt. What makes those quilts endure the length of time? And it is the stitching. It is the beauty um, of the quilt, the many different colors and shapes of, of patches that the quilt is constructed of. And I think it's, um, my, my metaphor for America is the quilt that never ends, the infinite quilt that is made beautiful by every pat patch in the quilt and that is fortified by its stitching. And I liken the stitching to what we do to protect ourselves as a, a society. For those who don't believe in diversity and those who challenge diversity, I try to listen to their beliefs with an open mind. I, I must admit sometimes I struggle with that. Um, those who are less tolerant um, tend to get my ears closed pretty quickly. Um, I have exercised more and more the, the ability to listen, even though my heart says shut down. And what I hear from those who 